share it, I will go ahead and share it to Word is Right as well. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Being live streamed on Facebook. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share this live out for y'all. Uh, get it on Word is Right and get it on my own, uh, on my own stuff uh, so we can get going today. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the Red or Green Books. Uh, the book signing of the next 10 poets. We're so, so, so honored and humbled to have all of them. We've got, um, it was Sweet Before It Was Sour by Ashley Edwards, uh, Armful of Poppies by Emily Cordes, Everything I Think Is All In My Mind by Jenner Lissima Brian Franco, Morning Flowers by Melinda Gigi, excuse me, Gigi, Melinda Jody Marie Arcadia. I will get all them names, girlfriend, I will do it. Uh, Miro, right? Miro's is always easy. There we go. Uh, Ab versus reaction. Sorry, Miro. Ebb and flow by Miro. Uh, Ab versus reaction. Nick Paleologos. The struggle within by Pam Rice. Lady Lotus uh, by Rosalind Diaz. Schoolyard crushes and Prozac prescriptions by Tori Letts. And Voices of the Fallen uh, by Philip Boykin, aka Wordsmith Billy. He had a tremendous uh, feature last night at The Word is Right. Uh, it was an absolutely sensational young man. Uh, so if he's able to join us today, you will be uh, in store for some great things. All right. So feel free to share the live if anyone is watching live and would like to come into the Zoom room. Uh, we can get the link dropped for you <clears throat> to come and join us today. Ah, here comes Philip. All right, so I'll put him on the list and we are going to uh, rock and roll. So at, at Red or Green Books, to give, if you're not familiar with the press or, or myself, I am Marissa Prada, uh, the founder of this uh, organization. It's a female forward publishing house that's run by women, built for women, built by women, uh, and really is designed to help push up poets, uh, many first time authors, uh, many people who are new to publishing, new to poetry. Uh, two of our poets in this launch are brand new. They only started writing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're so honored uh, to be uh, infusing poetry uh, as a way to cope with a lot of the stress and the anxieties uh, of everyday life, especially through the pandemic. Uh, we just released our debut, uh, our debut flagship anthology. This is Touching Tongues. It's a women's erotic anthology. It is 31 women from five different countries, almost 23,000 words of just beautiful erotica. Uh, the book is available, it's $25 plus shipping. Uh, in the US, it's $5 for shipping. So it's a, an incredible read. It's a big, thick, heavy book. <clears throat> We're submitting it for a few awards next year. Yes, you, you go go get it. Stocking stuffers. All right. Today we are and plus not to mention the original 10. Shout out to the original 10 of uh, uh, very trepidatious poets who helped us launch this summer. Uh, the entire collections of the original 10 are available on the website for sale and the entire collections of the next 10, the 10 poets you'll hear from today are available. You can purchase the, the collections themselves from the press as, as individual collections, or you can purchase all 20 books. If you get all 20 books, you will get the Women's Erotic Anthology for free. So it's, a, it's an idea for you. Otherwise, uh, please do not buy individual books yet from the press buy them from the poets. They're gonna tell you where and how you can buy directly from them today. Uh, if, you buy, if you buy the book during the show, you're welcome to uh, interact in the chat with the poets, uh, ask them questions, they'll sign it. You tell them how you want your book inscribed, they'll sign it for you today uh, and get that shipped out just in time for the holidays. Don't just buy one, buy, buy two or three because uh, these books are, are absolutely phenomenal. They make great gifts. Uh, so yes, so we'll go over all of that today, uh, where you can find them. Also on the website, redorgreenbooks.com. Red is R-E-A-D. It's not R-E-D, it's R-E-A-D, because we're out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and red or green chili is life here. Uh, so uh, go there, and you can read the bios on the poets. You can see their social media handles, their websites, their cash handles. All of that good stuff is also on the website. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start 
uh, with morning flowers. Some ground rules for people in the Zoom, please try to keep yourself muted uh, unless the poet's finishing and they're done and you can unmute yourself and go crazy and cheer and clap and, and be very happy for these poets. Uh, let's try to keep it as clean as possible today. There is no censorship on this platform except for hate speech. If I feel your threat to anyone in this room, you will be escorted out very swiftly and not brought back in. I don't put up with crap, okay? Uh, I, I run a tight ship here and I want these poets to feel as safe as they possibly can. And if I feel your threat to them, uh, you will not be allowed back in. So please don't abuse the chat either. The chat is available for you to use if you personal or private message a, a person in the chat. Please make sure you have consent before you just start talking up a storm, especially if it's in an in, inappropriate nature. All right, here we go. First up, uh, we're gonna bring up uh, Gigi. Uh, her book, Morning Flowers, is a tremendous re <clears throat> read. It is heartfelt. Um, it is a dedication to um, the, the life and the memory of her uh, late father. And so it's, it's an incredible, it's just an incredible story and it's an incredible ride. And it's um, an, a great way to, to memorialize someone who she loved deeply. And then the grief and everything that follows that. So I know everyone has an experience like that. And this book will affirm you, it'll affirm your heart, it'll affirm your soul. So I will read you what uh, Emily Cortez <clears throat> uh, wrote about Morning Flowers by Gigi, uh, by uh, Gigi Melinda Doty Marie Arcadia. I am stitching together new words accompanied with my name, Gigi Melinda Doty Marie Arcadia, proclaims in her poetry debut, Morning Flowers. True to this affirmation, the book intricately weaves together grief, memory, body image, queerness, romance, faith, and self-identity, often holding these multitudes side by side. Combined, they form a fierce and tender tapestry, a portrait of a young woman scarred by her past, but daring to love life and herself in spite of it. Y'all, please unmute your mics. Give a very warm round of applause to our first poet today. Gigi! Woo! Go get it, Gigi. Oh. Oh, poet. I always, I love when people like try and say my full name. <laughs> so my name is Gigi. You can just call me Gigi. It's short for Joey because I have a long fucking name. Um, so my book is Morning Flowers. I started writing poetry um in 2020, right before the pandemic. Uh spread and then uh in may of 2020 my dad was diagnosed with the geo um the geo uh it's a rare form of brain cancer and within three months of him being a completely healthy man he deteriorated and watching someone um die of brain cancer is hard on a multitude of levels, but also because we were all in isolation and my mom was a COVID nurse, so she, could, uh, she couldn't really touch him. And my sister was quarantined with her husband outside of the home. And so for most days of those three months, um, even though I was going to school like full-time, it was just me and my dad. And I was the only one that could actually like do a lot of the palliative care. And so my book really focuses just on kind of who I was before um, there's a chapter called self and love and body, and then just the difference and the shifting of what happens to a person when grief hits you. And then what is it now? Because you're different and grief doesn't ever go away. It doesn't get better. It gets different. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to focus on the rawness of that, because I think too often when we talk about grief, it's always the, it'll get better or, um, just it won't always be this bad no it's okay that it's going to be bad for a long time it's just how do we make sure that we can manipulate that bad so that we can keep going and so a lot of the poetry that i have um everyone who's read my book has cried <laughs> and a lot of people have said that it's very therapeutic um so you can i'll post it in the chat you can buy the book directly off of my website and when you put in your name, um, just write, you know, next to it, how you would like me to sign your book and I will gladly sign it. And now I'm going to read a few poems for everyone. And I'll, 
Um, I always like to do a few poems. I apologize for my dog if you hear her in the back. I have a pit bull named Winifred who likes to fight the wind. Um, I like to read a few poems before, um, then the during and the after. And you said I have about 10 or like maybe like eight minutes now, Marissa? About to, so I'm not gonna buzz you guys or anything. Okay. You just kind of go and get in a groove and then cool. if you wanna check in, you can. And don't forget cool. to tell people where they can buy, find you online and how they can oh, yes. it, all that good stuff. So you can find me at iron underscore resilience on Instagram. And then I did post my website, arcadian-poetry.com in the chat. And when you go to the website, there is a huge photo and there's an actual button that will lead you to the Google form that you can buy uh, my book from and it's connected to the cash app and the Venmo. So it's a step-by-step -step process. I make it very user-friendly. Okay, so I'll read. This poem is from Self. It is my favorite poem to read. I wrote it when I was at Lizzie's house this summer. It's my first, it's, I love it to be an opener. It's called Cicada Wings. I am beating to the beat of a humming cicada humming in the sink with the dying of summer. I wonder in the humidity if it holds secrets or whispers of the coldness about to creak in. I wonder if it pulses through the veins of a dying beetle. I wonder if they know that I can feel snow about to creak into my teeth. I wonder if anyone else around me knows that we are a single pulse that will never beat as strong as the beat before last. I am breathing, breathing now to the beat of crickets. They are not the main event, but the chorus. And I feel that, I feel the loudness of my surroundings where even my highest screams blend into the tapestry of noises. I wonder if my heartbeat is strong, strong enough to carry me through the winter, through the burning beneath the soil. I wonder if I'm the cricket. I wonder if I'm the cicada. I'll read a few. My favorite chapter in the book, I think, is my love chapter. So this one's, I left my voice in your bed. And don't worry, all my love poetry, none of them are too spicy. I'm a, I'm a deacon at a church, so I took out all my spicy poems because I knew my church friends would buy it. <laughs> We, we just wonder, give you a pseudonym then. We give you a pseudonym so you can publish all that under a different name. There you go. Dude. I wonder if you can hear me, the graveling of words, the voice lost in pillows and comforters. I mouth your name to the breast of a cold apartment, and I think I left my voice there. I wonder if you can hear me as I trace the vowels of sweet words I said to you as I make my way back home. I am now looking for my voice, unpacking my bags, wondering where I misplaced it. Maybe I left my voice in your apartment as we said goodbye. I hope you open your windows so the voice that called you breathtaking can seep out into the air. I'd like to have my voice back here, back home. Maybe I left it where I want to be, and maybe that's why I left it there. Then keep going. This is a week for love. What if I told you I love nestled in a city far away from home as I read books in coffee shops and pretended that I belonged here? Familiar with street names, your street name and your third floor walk up. What if I loved the distance too much? You'll never leave here and I'll never go there. But what if in that week we loved and lived our lives and dis like distance and a week to simply reminisce? What if I loved you for a week and I kept it tucked away? Forever. Through. This one is from the chapter called Cancer. This one's called Brother. And this is about my deadbeat uncle. Brother. I remember the stories of you and your brother eating ice cream by the pint days at the beach, how the time had melted from the two of you. 
weeks turned into years, how it all slowly slipped away. After the death of your parents, you grew silent as to why we lacked an uncle. The initial reason for the silence had been long forgotten. I remember the day I found your brother online and I messaged him and told him of your sickness, how he greeted me warmly, a warmth I could not return. And I asked, are you my father's brother? I remember my father's voice and how it lit up when, he called, when you called him for the first time, how you talked for the first weeks of his illness, how you came so late, too late for my father to greet you, how you thanked me at the funeral for taking care of his brother. And I wonder if you had forgotten what the words sounded like as you mouthed my brother. And then, let's see. I like, I love to read. This one's, I think you lived in summer. I think you lived in summer caught between the harsh New England seasons. I think you lived in summer of memories that played with the sound of the mower going and laughter in the pool. I remember how dark your skin tanned. I think you lived in summer. I wish we had gotten to go to the beach one last time. It had been years. We had promised after the chemo we'd go. I think you lived in summer cookouts on holidays, griping about having to work when the weather was so nice. I think you lived in summer as I packed you neatly into memories. I will always put you in summer between the first warm breeze of June and the last cookout of Labor Day. And I wonder if that's why you were married in June. And I wonder if that's why you died in August. I think I'll place your memories just as you lived in summer. And then I'm gonna read a few poems from, uh, let's see. So many to choose from. Okay, this one's a very, this one's one of my first ones that I ever performed at the Neo, so I really like this one. It's Bones Fastened from Wood. I can't tell if the enemy that lives in my house bare bones fastened from woods, if it's the rocking chair or the bed he slept in that was not yet his deathbed. The bed that was nestled in the living room as I assembled upon finding out the diagnosis, the bed that would make him more comfortable, the bed he would get better in, the bed that sat in the living room for three months after he died. This was the bed my sister and I slept in shifts in, the bed my mother slept in, the communal peace as we observed his last days. No, my feelings of discretion are not with the hospice bed that came and went so quickly. The only purpose was the inevitable end. I wonder if it's the bed that was before his deathbed or if it's the rocking chair that rocks so rhythmically throughout the years, undisturbed by bad news that still sits there lacking its purpose that mocks me at night when I still hear footsteps and movement from the other room and its only purpose is a reminder. And then I got two more and then I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skedaddle. Okay. So this one is one of my newer ones and I got to slip it right into the book right before. This one's called Birthday Gift and Running Shoes. By the way, I sent in my full book on my actual birthday. So that was a cool little birthday gift to myself. An early birthday present to myself is in this upcoming year is one of movement, the permission to abandon everything. I find myself not digging my heels into the dirt, wanting stability, but using it as traction. As I am running, they say you can't run away from your problems. What with frequent flyer miles, I'd like to disagree. I've packed my life into small bags, bouncing from city to city. Don't stay long enough for people to miss you, but just long enough for you to be remembered. Remember, it doesn't stop the grief or the emptiness. I'd rather be sad somewhere exciting than in my hometown where faces are blank. They feel familiar, but foggy. And I'm so tired of feeling so fucking foggy. Is it running from your problems if the problem is stillness and stagnation? Is it running away from home if home is just a house now? I'm learning to be okay with sadness sitting in the room when joy is present as long as sadness is not the only guest, as long as it's not the host. Is it running away from your problems if you're not running from but running towards some place that feels like home? 
then what better gift to give yourself than to give yourself the gift of buying yourself a big bag and running shoes. And then this is my last poem. And I love to, I love, I don't get to read this poem often, but it's the last poem of my book. And it's called to the reader of this poem, but it's gonna to be to the listener of this poem for this purpose. To the listener of this poem, I'm not good at goodbyes. Have you had heard the sounds of my pages of my grief? I've written you a farewell. I hope you live a messy life, one of chaos and joy. I hope when your heart sinks beneath the grass, you can pick it back up again. I hope you leave photographs wherever you go. I hope you hold your breath for a moment, if only a moment, to remember what it feels like for air to fill your lungs. I hope you dig your fingers beneath the dirt. I hope you scoop up earth, air, earth and place seeds wherever you go. And I hope when you die from them, I hope morning flowers bloom and I wish you the most beautiful goodbye. Well, thank you everyone so much. Once again, you can find me on iron underscore resilience on Instagram and arcadian-poetry.com. Uh, <laughs> buy my book yes you guys unmute yourselves please give it a big round of applause up to melinda Gigi, jody hey gg oh i'll let you know that was really amazing the fact that you started doing poetry during the pandemic and you have the guts to come up here and get down is amazing to me and yeah congratulations on your thank book thank you so much have a good job Thank you. Incredible set, yes. Gigi. Incredible set. Yeah. It's it's so awesome. I just love that book. In fact, I gave your book um, uh, uh, my my extra copy to uh, my friend Liz uh, because she lost her mom, and uh, I'm hoping that that helps her uh, that helps her grieve that. All right, we're going to keep rocking and rolling through uh, the sets today. If, if people wind up joining late uh, and you have uh, questions for poets afterwards, then uh, definitely write, write your questions down, bring them. Uh, Gigi, drop all your stuff in the chat as well. If you're watching live on Facebook, go follow this woman. Uh, all of her stuff is on the website, redrgreenbooks.com, red, R-E-A-D. All of her handles, social media, where you can find her stuff, where you can buy the book, please buy directly from the poets uh, this year so that they can, uh, you know, they can make some money. That's what we're about, helping people make money here. <laughs> Let's go. All right, Ashley Edwards is up next. Are you ready, my beautiful friend? <clears throat> yeah. All right, so we're bringing up Ashley. Uh, this is her book. It was sweet before it was sour. Uh, the cover art for Ashley's book is done by Shane Maynard uh, with Guerrilla Poets. Shane is our cover artist here at Red or Green Books. She does the majority of the covers. And uh, so here we go. I will read you um, what, uh, what Angie C. wrote about Ashley's book. Sweet Before Was Sour by Ashley Edwards is an amazing book of poetry. When reading the sweet part, it brings me back to the days of my 17-year-old self, so in love with this person or the idea of being in love and all the sweet nothings that come with it. Fast forward to the sour and you get the harsh realization of love gone wrong. It reminds us how even in both times of in in both times love is love and beauty excuse me in both times love is love and its beauty in it is inevitable. Her words speak volumes to young and old souls alike. I think everyone can also use her self-love recipe, especially since throughout the sour phase, she still loves and puts herself first. This book is amazing, hands down amazing, and I am so proud of this woman. So please welcome up uh, Ashley Edwards, the author of It Was Sweet Before with Sour. Uh, such a phenomenally beautiful book from a beautiful soul. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley. You've got about 10 minutes and don't forget to tell people where to find you and how to buy your book and all that good stuff. Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. Um, so yeah, so my book, um, It Was Sweet Before It Was Sour. Um, I do not have a website right now. I'm working on figuring out what I want to do with that. Um, so for right now, 
um, you can either just message me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can email me. I'll post all my like Instagram, Facebook, email, all that stuff down there. Um, and then, yeah, I'll ship it out to you. Or if you're in the Richmond area where I live at, um, I've also been like meeting people locally as well. If you just want to do that. So it's kind of up to you. But yeah, that's how you can get it. Um, but basically, I have been writing poetry since I was like 16, 15, 16 ish. Um, I started writing it because my mom had passed away when I was 10 um, from cancer. And so it was kind of just a way for me to cope and kind of get myself out there and just express my feelings. And then probably when I was about 18, 19, I decided to actually go to like an open mic and actually write or actually like perform and read. And then everyone was like blown away. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm good at this. And so that's when I kind of started taking it more seriously and kind of doing it. Um, but yeah, so it was sweet before it was sour. The idea of my book is really just the sweet side of life and all the good things that happen, like when we're in love and like everything is going good and it's sunshine and daisies. And then obviously the sour side of the book is more about, you know, when life hits you a little bit harder um, and kind of just dealing with that and handling that in love and grief and all kinds of different ways. Um, so I'm gonna read a few poems. I'm not gonna take up a lot of y'all's time. Y'all know I don't like to do that, but um, I'm gonna read a few of the poems from Sweet and then a few of the poems from Sour so you can kind of get the idea of both. Um, and they're pretty short poems. None of them are super long, so yeah. But I'll start with the sweet side and I'm gonna read the recipe for self-love um, that in my review, what she was talking about. Um, the people that have gotten my book and have read it, um, they've told me that it's one of their favorite poems. So I guess I will go ahead and read that one first. It's also the first poem of my book and the only book or the only poem that has a title in my whole book. Um, so recipe for self-love, one pound of courage half a tablespoon of forgiveness, two teaspoons of resilience, three cloves of appreciation, ground courage in the skin on high heat, add forgiveness and resilience, stirring occasionally, let simmer and top with appreciation. Serving size, one, calories, fuck off. So that is recipe for self-love. And then let's see. All right. So still reading from the sweet side. And like I said, the rest of these don't have any titles. So we'll just go rock with it. The scariest thing about grieving is that it gets better. The days will blend over into new ideas. Birds will wake you up to symphonies that make your eardrums orgasm. The sun will shine. Friends will laugh so hard their bellies will throw in the towel. Someone will find the love of their life and invite you to the wedding. And you will go and put on your finest outfit, curl your hair and spread eyeshadow across your lids like a child finger painting. You will dance like your legs are teenage lovers who just had their first kiss. See, the world keeps spinning. The seasons keep changing. Time does not stand still. It's one of the most amazing things that can come even after the storm has spit up all its debris. So that is that one. And then I'm just kind of picking random pieces, y'all. Uh, let's see. All right. So this next one, y'all, I was in love, y'all. I was in love. Cool child. Okay, so this is a... Uh, this is what I got for this one. Give y'all a little love poem with y'all all lovey dovey. I wanna grow young with you. Like our love has Benjamin Button disease. So as the years pass by, it gets purer like the love of a child holding on to a pinky. I want us to be 70 years old arguing about who made the first move. 
I want to plant you in my palms so every time we argue and I ball my fist, I'm reminded of how fragile your petals are. I want to play freeze tag with our lungs on the days we take each other's breath away. Years from now, I want to look at your smile on a random rainy afternoon, put my rain boots on and splash in your dimples. I want to take car rides at two in the morning with nothing but our heartbeats playing. I want to laugh with you until our stomachs start hiccuping butterflies. I want to dance with you for as long as our bones are willing to work until they melt. I want to melt into this world with you. I want to be with you until this world no longer has the space for us. All right, so now we're gonna get a little dark. We're gonna go to the sour side. So what a great transition for that cute little love poem. And now I'm about to be all stressy and depressy. So uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. There used to be a time I thought, I thought a casket sounded more comfortable than my own skin. Imagine a butterfly that would rather stay in its cocoon than to spread its wings and fly. All right. I hope one day your love stops haunting me. The echoes of your laughter stop getting caught in the hallways of my eardrums. The imprints of your fingers unlearn the shape of my hand. That the memories with you fade off like when you haven't watched a show in a while. That even when I love new people, your face stops becoming the mask I put on them. I hope one day I can be freed of your love but I must say, even a life sentence like this with you is chaotically beautiful. All right, next poem. I love to watch movies. They make me forget about the real world, make me feel like I'm living the story and in these stories, you don't exist, which means I don't hurt. Finally, you're not the star of the show, and I, not the heartbroken girl, a role I get casted for far too often. And then I'm going to read one more from the sour side. And then I'll be out of y'all's hair. And I'm looking for a specific one. So give me like two seconds. All right, here we go. When the drugs don't help, the whiskey bottle is empty and I'm still up thinking about you. I pray to God to take the hurt away. But lately, it feels like I've been getting his voicemail and the moon is his receptionist that never takes a message. And the sun is the janitor trying to clean up the mess, but I am a big mess to clean, which is why I think you left me here, spilt everywhere in the first place. That's what I got for y'all. <laughs> um, so I will post the all the good stuff in the chat so everybody can um, have it as far as where to follow me and how to get my book. Yes. Well, we're also live though, so you want to tell people? Oh, you're right. I forgot. <laughs> okay, 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 y'all. Okay, y'all. Let me get myself together. So Facebook is just Ashley Edwards, um, and it's a picture of me. So I mean. Hopefully there's not too many, although that is a common name actually, but it's Ashley Edwards. Um, you can also find me on Instagram where Instagram, I probably post a little bit more poetry than on my Facebook, um, but my Instagram is underscore melange and that's M-I-L-A-N-G-E. 
underscore M-I-L-A-N-G-E. Um, as far as, um, but yeah, you can message me on there if you want the book. You can also just send me an email. Um, my email is A-S-H-E-2127 at gmail.com. And just subject it like book order, and then I'll message you and we can get all the details as well. Um, and then, yeah, that's how you can get the book. Yes. Y'all, unmute your mics, please. Give it up for Ashley Edwards and her book. Oh, it was sweet. Oh, oh, wow. That was Amazing. awesome, Ashley. Thank Very you. sad. <laughs> I love this salty. Let's go. <laughs> Yes, that's only I'm in place so so it's all good. Uh like give it, give it to me, Ashley. Uh we can handle this hour. Let's go. Uh she's she's lovely and she's been writing for a really long time and her book is 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 great. It's wonderful. Uh so please definitely pick up copies of these uh, books from these poets. You can always go to the website uh, to find the author bios are all up on the website, where uh, their websites, their emails, their social media handles, all that good stuff where to find these poets will all be uh, on the Red or Green Books uh, website as well. Uh, you can always message us at Red or Green Books here on Facebook, Instagram. You can message us at Word is Right. You can message me, Marissa Prada, and I will get you hooked up with these poets uh, if you miss them, if you miss this event and you're watching this live uh, back in time. All right, so we're going to keep moving on. Uh, we got Emily Cordes up now. After Emily, we have Generalissimo, Brian Franco, and we got Nick P and Philip Boykin, and then I will go over all the other books for the authors who couldn't be here today, so you can see uh, the rest of everyone's um, uh, book from this launch. All right, so this is uh, Emily Cordes' book, Armful of Poppies. Cover art is done by Shane Mayer with Gorilla Poets. It is an absolutely stunning book. Uh, when I was at the El Paso uh, craft fair, seriously, your, your cover and Tori's cover uh, and Miro's cover got the most attention. Nick, I mean, they all they all got attention, but for they just this one just popped uh, for so many people at the craft fair. Uh, so it was uh, it was wonderful, and um, yeah, I think almost everyone I sold a I think I sold at least one book from everyone. So yeah, I'm just excited. Look at Arlene's got your book there. Yeah, it's uh, it's these and they're all so different, y'all. Like. I can't convey to you the diversity in this in this collection of, of poets. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and read to you what Mary Blinderman wrote uh, as a review for Emily Cordes's book. She said, uh, Mary says, Armful of Poppies is a delight. The voice behind these poems dances across the page with a galloping rhythm that is both unmistakable and imitable drawing on a rich tapestry of mythology and a wide range of stylistic influences, Emily crafts a delicious read. At times she is playful and she takes indulgent pleasure in theatrically vivid imagery, yet what she truly seems to wield is a remarkable facility for honesty and forgiveness. No matter the anguish, the spirited resilience of these poems is clear. Grace keeps slipping through. Uh, I have Mary Blenderman's voice playing in my head as I'm reading her words, right? I, <laughs> oh, big shout out to Mary Blenderman. Thank you for that review. All right, we're going to welcome up Emily Cordes to the stage. Y'all unmute your mic. Think of her a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it still it still blows my mind to just see like other people like holding copies of my book and when you were posting the 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 photos from El Paso I was just like holy shit people in Texas are 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 reading this and this is it's a lot to wrap my head around but it's so exciting I'm really I'm really you I'm get really an happy. hour on the stage at the New York City Poetry Festival can you imagine you and Nick and Miro and Roz and Generalissimo can you imagine everyone up on the stage re Reading your poetry like in person. We will detonate the stage, man. We'll, we'll all detonate. have each other's books like in person too, right? Uh, I, I just, I, I just got to take it. Like, yeah, let's go. It never gets old. All right. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you all. Um, yeah. So a uh, little bit about my uh, backstory. Uh, 
So I, um, I, I'm, my background's mostly in theater. Uh, I'm an, I'm an actress and I also, um, I've, I've also sort of been dipping my toe a little bit more into uh, playwriting or co-creating devised plays lately. Um, but I've written poetry for the better part of my life since, uh, since my teens and had kind of sidelined the practice for a little bit, but, um, I was working, um, for a couple of years with the New Yorican Poets Cafe, um, in the admin offices, I was doing fundraising and marketing for them, but I was kind of more removed from their artistic world. Um, when, when the day was over, I'd usually just kind of peace out and do my own thing. I wouldn't really go to as many, shows as as you would think uh but then the pandemic happened and uh everything went online all our open mics and everything went online so uh the the admin staff would be running zoom tech for these and it just brought me face to face with the immense talent and all the great people uh that are involved in the cafe's artistic community and uh it inspired me to you know pick poetry back up to keep writing um and uh, then, you know, Marissa was re reaching out about, you know, publishing it. And I, had, over time, you know, throughout the pandemic, I had sort of amassed enough of it to actually form a cohesive book. So um, this book very much came out of the pandemic. Um, and that's sort of what a lot of the themes of Armful of Poppies is about. It's about, um, you know, poison and medicine, the good and the bad growing out of the same sources, um, especially with the symbolism of poppies as being like so many things like sleep and death and remembrance and rebirth and then a, a zillion different things. I'm really interested in those dichotomies. So um, the book is divided into four sections, uh, each one named after a different part of a plant, uh, roots, seeds, thorns, and blossoms. I'm going to read a few from, uh, from each section here. And this one is uh, the very first poem in the book uh, from the Roots section. Roots is either uh, they're sort of my earlier works or stuff that deals more with like my, my roots, whether that's my family roots or my artistic roots. And this one I wrote in, um, in college actually, and I think back in like, God, in like 2008, and it's called uh, New England Daphne. She arches in suspended dance or in curtailed chase her spindle legs paralyzed mid-flight in ecstasy. For which is better, to remain innocent, caressed by the earth, but self-denied the gentle touch of flesh, or to collapse in the God's embrace, birthing dryad children silently, stretched toward an ever-distant sun. Perhaps she's traded one hell for another, don't we all become a casualty to love or to our fears? She has her joys, her sister nymphs and grandfather elms to protect her, dresses of fur, moss, and autumn winds, bird choirs in her tangles. But when a college girl passes by her, pleading with a lover on the phone, she weeps slow amber tears. She's been there yet still wants more. Okay, um, this next one is uh, from the uh, seeds section. This was kind of, it was interesting. So I was reading on, uh, uh, Lizzie has uh, her deadpan dope open mic that she just started doing every, uh, every other Tuesday. Uh, definitely check it out if you get the chance, it's awesome. And uh, one of our poet friends, Idiongo, read this poem, read my own poem to me on this mic, which was another kind of a surreal experience. But this one I, I really, I really like, and it's called Pixie. Four foot 10 and doll sized body, cartoon voiced and sherbet haired. Still, you scare me just a little. A memory of myself before I snipped my wings off or just learned to hide them better. Devotees of the same goddess, whirring through the same big cities, speeding faster than raindrops, sugar and vodka, combat boots and tool, colors blazing, live broadcasted, poems inscribed on walls and textbooks, hearts passed out like penny candy, then surprised when it's devoured, wrappers littering the street. I want to love you like I want to love the girl I was. 
bring her soup and homemade bread, grab her hand and take her dancing, sit with her till her pulse steadies, whisper to her to keep writing and shout to never apologize for it. But love, it's not safe here for creatures like us. Wings and hooves and horns aren't dress code. Mermaids drown on dry land. Even islands are no refuge. And if you do survive, they'll get you, put you in a sideshow, trot you out to show their mercy. So exotic, well-behaved. Maybe I've become too callous, cold and rigid like this city. My screams stuffed inside a pillow, not strung through a ticket line. But I'll go where you can't follow, where it's lit backstage with string lights. For the ones who can traverse worlds are the ones most needed here. Okay, um, this, this next one uh, is from the thorns section. Thorns is kind of a little bit uh, darker uh, stuff. Uh, seeds was stuff a little bit more um, new, new sort of promising stuff, inspiration, experimenting with some different styles, forms, subjects. And yeah, thorns is kind of the darker material, material here. This one's called a uh, voodoo doll. I wrote this pretty early in the pandemic. A canceled trip, a shuttered show, a photo of who we once were. Each little loss, a pinprick and I, a voodoo doll. With eyes and mouth stitched shut, facing inward. Each jab shakes the body, violent acupuncture traveling through meridians, setting nerves aflame. Lacking space to hold my vastness, I want to shrink much further. A cursed poppet to abandon, cover me in grave dirt, leave me at the crossroads. Turn three times, spit over your shoulder and forget. But I remember. The things you bury will grow back if you're not careful. The dead unmourned will turn to zombies. You have to release them. Send them off with jazz and fanfare. Lay them softly in the earth. Plant flowers on their graves to grow out of the ashes. That is how you turn what's buried into seeds. Uh, this next one is also from the Thorns section. It's called Tiradito. It's, uh, it was inspired by, there's a historic site in Tucson, Arizona called the uh, El Tiradito Shrine. It's um, the only uh, Catholic shrine dedicated to someone who is considered a sinner. Um, a lot of very interesting backstory, but basically a, a man who uh, slept with his mother-in-law and was murdered by his father-in-law um, and very dramatic uh, mur murder love triangle kind of that went on there. But now it's this, this famous landmark where people will like leave offerings and make wishes. So uh, Tiradito. Tomb of the castaway enshrined in contradiction. Sinner, lover, reckless fucker, cut down where he stood. Now in death, a legend savior of the barrio, bathed in wax and teardrops, walls cannot contain you, splintering repression, grace keeps slipping through. Nuestro Señor de los Perdidos, Jude or Judas, who's to say? Tiradito, were you sorry or too stubborn to regret it? Dying as you died, laughing from on high, at this world where love's a crime and the powers who once scorned you fade like shadows in the sunlight. No more need to fight the good fight as the people cast their wishes in the dust motes at your feet. Tu y yo tiradito, two sinners who got lucky, saved from hell on technicality. Though it's hard to tell in this blazing border town, where the devils on your shoulder make more sense than all the angels. And if hell's not being able to tell your story, 
maybe we're just steps from falling in or getting out. Gracias, tiradito, por este recuerdo. Castaways can find redemption in the tales that we've rewritten. And iconoclasts and sinners with their candles poised in vigil can find wishes granted in the rising dawn. And these next, these next, uh, do I have time for, um, I was going to read two more. Is that, do I have enough time for two more? Sure. Sweet. Okay. So this next one is uh, the title poem called Armful of Poppies. I wrote this after getting my second vaccine. I roll up my sleeve as the needle approaches. Old t-shirt from Giverny, Monet's poppies blaze open. Adorned in remembrance of a world rendered comatose, fairy tale beauties by evil force frozen, yet piercingly lucid as thorned vines grew over us. Awakened by pinprick, can spells be thus broken? Now my shoulder blooms red, tiny blossom unfolding, a miniature miracle caught in stop motion small as a poppy seed, powerfully potent, birthing dreams of a better world steeped in devotion, or a return to ignorance, rush for the comfort zone? Will we trade hard-won clarity for dull myopia? But each century's plague bears its own ring of roses and scar tissue stronger than flesh that's unbroken as the earth in her wisdom yields our cures and our opiates. May our poppy-filled arms carry emblems of hope. All right, and uh, this is just uh, one more from the uh, Blossom section. And this one goes out to um, all my poetic family at the New Yorkian Poets Cafe. Whenever someone does a brand new poem on the online open mics, we call it New Shit. So this one is called New Shit. New shit, who dis? My inner perfectionist dies in fire that we spit. Ego's gonna shit some bricks, but self-judgment stones and sticks when my truth can't be eclipsed. Fuck the need to be so precious. Got no time for second guesses. Lay it out now hot and fresh from the cat's ass, speaker says. In the Zoom mirrors we're reflected. Hearts exposed and unprotected, but like cookie dough and sex, it's the raw stuff that's the best. Mondays, Thursdays on the mic, lighting up my COVID nights, even when shit hits were tight, even mandates from on high, petty fucks who suck us dry, politicians oozing spite, can't extinguish our shared light. Later, as I lie in bed, New shits forming in my head, notes apps filling A to Z, chat books lined up to be read till the day we slam again. So pass the mic like blunt and lighter, spark it like the energizer. Thank you fam for this reminder, shit can become fertilizer. Thank you all. That set was lit. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. Oh my God, Emily. Yes. Where can people find you? How can they buy your book? Y'all need to buy these books. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, Emily Cordis on Facebook. Um, just got a new Instagram. My old one got hacked, unfortunately, but uh postmodern dot psyche not to be confused with the old one where it's all one word gonna drop this in the chat um yeah and thank you all for uh for listening and um thank you for supporting my work and i will update that on the website as well um uh, emily awesome so yeah if you guys uh have information and stuff that changes over time uh just let me know and i'll update the website all right oh man I just love it. <laughs> it's the sass landing. Emily Gordon's coming out with the sass. Oh, yes. Um, 
we are still going to do that screenplay. Uh, I would love to do that. And we, we should, we, we should do it because I want to do the poetry playhouse, uh, you know, poets writing, uh, writing plays, and then, you know, setting up a, a, a night, an event, everyone can, can sign up for a part or randomly pick a part, um, and read a play, uh, to each, with each other. It's so much fun. We get to do the play, Emily. All right. <laughs> Like, what if it won? Like, what if, what if it actually became like a big deal? Uh, I think Broadway needs to be sexed. Uh, let's uh, bring some sex to Broadway. All right, <clears throat> we're gonna keep going. Uh, I got uh, the wonderful generalissimo Brian Franco is next. And this is his book, Everything I Think is All in My Mind. He designed the cover art for his book. It's a phenomenal, uh, it's, it's almost as interesting as he is. Uh, so let me find this very special review. Uh, it's the first review, in fact, in his book. It is by Dr. Martina McGowan, and she writes, <clears throat> Brian Franco's first book, Everything I Think is All in My Mind, highlights his abilities as a writer, wit, wry sense of humor, tongue-in-cheek observations of the world, and sensitivity to that same world. He sheds much needed light on dealing with our monsters, human, emotional, and psychological, while imploring us to stay the course of our personal labyrinthine journey and to take part in life's dance rather than sitting on the sidelines. He reminds us that we are never truly alone, even in those tough times of isolation, which he has turned into one of his muses. He weaves clever and delicate details about himself his personal struggles and leaves breadcrumbs to help us find our way forward through humor and poetry. Y'all, please unmute your mics. Give a very warm welcome to our next poet, Generalissimo Brian Franco. Let's go, Generalissimo. Thank you. Um, before yeah. I read, yes, yes, yes. before I actually read um, this poem. Where did I just have that? Bear with me one second. Before I read anything from the book, I just want to go ahead and uh, read a poem about Emily. Well, about her poetry, really. And her poetry is just so beautiful. It's even, I, I think it's a bit esoteric in some way. So this is something I wrote after reading her book. It's for Ms. Cordes. I want to exist in a field of multicolored poppies till I get high. Not the type of poppies that make heroin and morphine, poppies born of poetry. Poppies with silky petals so translucent when sunlight passes through them, a plethora of psychedelic prisms rise into atmosphere. Poppies that sing sweet bird song when they open to drink in morning dew. Poppies that when wind decides to detour through, Anyone who is near feels as if they just drank the purest ice cold spring water that is so pure it is void of taste, yet creates a drunken high so perfect others can't see it in their eyes because it exists inside their soul. And um, from my book, I'm going to just read the introduction because that's, that is a good explanation of the book itself. Um, everything I think in all, all, everything I think all in my mind, poetry concerning the human mind is the culmination of nearly 30 years of writing. It discusses my decades long battle with chemical depression and anxiety. The collection also covers human emotions and behaviors like anger, confusion, forgiveness, kindness, bullying, and gaslighting. We are all made of blood, skin, and bones. There is no such thing as a perfect person. Our faults and the faults of the people we love exist and are part of the package we accept when we enter relationships with each other. My poetry can be serious, silly, and even surreal, but I hope straightforward and accessible. I believe poetry can be communication as well as artistic expression. The human mind is a place that makes decisions and guides emotions, and all of us have one to use as we wish. And the first page in my book is called A School of Haiku. It's six haikus. The last two have titles. One, the meaning of life is not about breathing, but deciding to breathe. Two, Cynicism is an acquired attitude. No one is born that way. Three, optimism is more than an idea. It can be mantra. Four, 
embrace your crazy. Who you are is who you are. You are human. Five, figurative life best for sale. When it rains and rains, my mind sends me to places perfect for drowning. Six, the worms can't do all the work. Teach a man to fish, and he might not have patience to wait for a fish. And I'm going to read this poem called Philosophy by Popeye the Sailor Man, or Because I Lost My Birth Certificate Doesn't Mean I Was Never Born. It's true, I'm certifiable, a fact undeniable. Since I know myself better than anyone else, the source is reliable. Subversion therapy for me is not viable. So say what you wanna say. I look in the mirror every day. What I always see is me. I am what I am what I am. I was born this way. A fact I can't change or rearrange. There are others like me on land and swimming the seas. They aren't afraid to be loud about being proud about whom they were born. And despite certain scorn, they will walk tall and never fall from the words of others who despite their druthers will look in their mirrors each day only to see someone born that way. Now, the next poem is called The World's Greatest Invention. My attention span is somewhat defective. My shrink says, I don't look people in the eyes when I talk. Also, I purposely pretend to not listen when I listen. So when I say something, others won't be listening to what I say. It is as if that overly cushy pleather couch is a human-sized external disk drive wirelessly wired to his note-taking laptop so he can run a mental virus scan on me. The patent for that invention must be worth millions of dollars, maybe even billions. That is why I drive an hour and a half each way for a 50-minute appointment every other week. And I actually did go to an anxiety specialist that was over an hour and a half from where I lived. And he was an excellent um, psychologist. Okay, the secret to surviving sinkholes. It seemed to happen so organically. I decided to stay in bed more than five minutes, then 10 minutes, then an hour and so on and so forth. Tears happen. For no discernible reason, out of the blue, without warning, without trigger, without help, I would have stayed in bed. This sudden sadness didn't just happen, it manifested. It was waiting in the wings to throw me the worst kind of surprise party. No people, no presents, no cake, but plenty of candles to burn down my life, my self-esteem, my sense of worth. Without help, I would have accepted the storyline, the bed, told me that it was the safest place for my existence, but a bed that talks is the voice of depression. Depression can seem like a cul-de-sac sinkhole that sucks in a car parked on the street, consumes a fire hydrant, takes a bite of sidewalk, then attacks a front yard working its way up a walkway to the front door and politely rings the doorbell before swallowing the door. A family of four and two dogs have to escape through the backyard, abandon everything they own, even cars, because the sinkhole expanded westward, engulfing the driveway. The inestimable speed of a sinkhole acts like depression when the word chemical is bandied about by a doctor. No words used by doctors are bad words. Some words are just crutches, something temporary to the person who listens to their bed instead of their head starts recognizing the existence of their heart their skin, their soul. Their peripheral vision is hampered by a hoodie the bed gave them as a gift at the surprise party that surprisingly never ended. But now the owner of the bread has asked for help. I learned I can yell surprise at the bed, get up and walk away. And it's always, I just wanna to say to everyone, it's important that when you feel down that you should never be afraid to talk to a friend if that's all you, if you don't want to find professional help, talk to a friend, talk to a family member, find someone to just talk to. Is that We can't always do it on our own and most likely we always need a little help. Find a free group session. A lot of, a lot of hospitals have group sessions through um, mental health organizations, it's really worthwhile. Um, and I'm gonna read the next one I'm gonna read. Um, I came 
out of a group session that I attended at a depression and anxiety group session that I attended. And I asked the woman who I wrote this about, if I could read, I wrote the poem while after listening to her and I showed it to her and I asked her if I could ever read it out loud and she said yes. So why it's impossible to hang an excuse from a wife. A woman whose tenacity reminds me of Dame Elizabeth Taylor once said, I'm not where I want to be, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be. When discussing her various addictions, obsessions, and temptations, she refers to herself as an urge surfer. The tenets of urge surfing, one, urge surfers don't need surfboards. Two, an urge is a chip that grows too large for its shoulder host. Three, all urges require their hosts to walk on high wires made of barbed wire. Four, urges are profoundly verbal. Feel free to use me to ride the waves of the ocean that is your life. Urges are needy beggars. Don't throw me away, keep me, you need me. Six, urges are misguided philosophers. If you say no to me, you are only expressing negativity. How to respond to an urge. One, no thank you. Two, I was built to balance on my own two feet. Three, waves exist in oceans. My life exists on dry land. Four, feel free to surf the sea without me. Of course, I have no doubt that without me, you will sink. Five, goodbye, good luck, and thank you very much. Afterthought, always be courteous and cordial to urges. Urges never die. They just slither away into the woodwork of your soul only to resurface at the most an opportune. I have this other poem, March, which is called Wrong Time, Wrong Place. I walked only six or seven Manhattan blocks that afternoon. Yet in that short amount of time, I completed my first marathon. Colors no longer existed. The world was gray like a black and white TV. Everyone and everything around me was in slow motion. Then I realized it was I that was in slow motion. If you play a 45 RPM record on 78, the voices will sound like Chip and Dale or Alvin and the Chipmunks. If you play a 45 RPM record on 33 and a third, voices will stretch into an unintelligible perpetual piece of taffy. Emotion no longer existed. Exhalation no longer existed. My lungs filled with bus and taxicab exhaust. My every breath was asthmatic and I couldn't find any oxygen for this new emblematic emphysema. All of a sudden, I was an ant who accidentally returned to the wrong mound of dirt. And when I delivered a microscopic piece of human discarded chocolate chip cookie crumb to my queen, I realized this was not my queen. And this was not the first time in my life I had arrived at the place. Um, why Wonder Bread is the true eighth wonder of this wondrous world. I am not Spider-Man, but I have climbed God only knows how many walls in my lifetime. My fingertips are so cut and callous, they barely have fingerprints, but they are addicted to walls. When I get to the top of a wall, I turn into Humpty Dumpty. And as I sit atop the wall, the wall narrows and narrows. And I have a great fall, but all the king's horses and all the king's men do not exist in my world. And it never fails to be one of those so hot you could fry an egg days. And when I hit the ground, my shell breaks perfectly in half and I turn into a perfect sunny side up egg. The person who discovers me calls the Guinness Book of World Records who fly down in their corporate Concorde jet then measure my diameter and proclaim me to be the largest sunny side up egg ever. And since no one knows I was the egg, the person who discovers me gets a photo on the cover of the New York Post breaking my yellow with a slice of burnt toast. If ever I should climb a wall, have a great fall and land sunny side up, I hope whoever discovers me calls Ripley's Believe It or Not. They too have a corporate concord, but they always travel with at least a case of Wonder Bread and Wonder Bread makes the most wonderful toast. And uh, I think, you know, I'm gonna do two more shorter pieces. One is called When Hate Crashes a Dinner Party. 
In my youth, thoughts stirring through my consciousness would sometimes jump into the outside world due to internal pressures, causing a collateral exodus of spirit from my being. Whenever hate tried to enter without permission, and grab my throat to choke out any common sensibility. But I didn't find such violence tempting. And when hate grabbed my throat, I went limp and played dead till hate ran off before the police could arrive to find hate had murdered another soul, despite that I was alive and well, and could, as could be with hate's handprints fading from my neck. And finally, this is called bleeding. When I get cut, my blood flows from my skin like lava from Kilauea. Sometimes I need more than direct pressure to make it stay inside. Sometimes I breathe recollections my subconscious decides it's time to say goodbye to, ones it held on to forming grudges on the inside walls of my personality that have aged enough to naturally decay and chip away into history. Sometimes I bleed bits and pieces of my childhood I have hoarded away to create an inflatable stunt mattress to break the fall of obstacles and traumas of adulthood. Sometimes my blood runs clear, forming inconsolable tears when the words, the words are not available to wrap my soul in warmth, when I've slipped and fallen into consequential hypothermia. Sometimes my blood is made of words that form into poetry when my tears and thoughts pull together when that happens, my blood no longer belongs to me. Thank you. Oh man, y'all. Give it up for Generalissimo, Brian Franco. Amazing set. So amazing, amazing. That was a lot, man. Amazing, dude. Thank, Thank you. And I just put I just put all the info how to buy my book into the chat. Thank you. Can G, do you want to uh, tell people since you since we're live and they might be here, you know, watching this after the fact? Do you want to um, just tell people where they can find you or how to email you? Oh yes, um, you can find me at Generalissimo Brian Franco on Facebook and of course G N R L S M O on Instagram. Awesome. My email. Yes, thank you very much. And your no no go I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut you off. Do your email. Oh Brian I at gmail.com. Brian I at gmail.com. Ah oh, yes, you guys gotta get it. Everything I think is all in my mind. And the cover is stunning to you. It really is. I can't wait to bring every one of these books uh to New York. And speaking of poets who uh whose books we did uh just coming in the room we got poet con Raspaya is here she's part of the original 10 this is her book Midas. gotta give a shout out to the original 10 poets uh to launch the red or green books uh here uh, her book is absolutely phenomenal as well so welcome poet con i'm so glad you're here i was just thinking about you matter of fact and then all of a sudden you pop up in the waiting room so i'm so i'm so glad that you are here all right we're going to keep rocking and rolling this show we got a few more poets to go as as we finish up i sent tori a message uh she was wondering if we were still going to be doing it uh at about five o'clock eastern standard time and i was like well i don't know but of course we started late today so we are still here um uh, hopefully she can come when she gets off work and she can read uh and i know miro said she was going to be a little later than she anticipated which is fine because we still have a couple poets to go so uh, next up, we got Ad versus Reaction by Nick Paleo Logos. Uh, cover art is done by Shane Maynard with Gorilla Poets. Uh, it's absolutely stunning book. Uh, this young man has had quite a journey to his poetry book. And I'm honored, beyond honored, to be, be publishing all of you mm. uh, this year. So I'll go ahead and read uh, what, uh, what Rosalind Diaz. Ros is a, another one of our next 10 poets. Uh, who is unable to be here today, but Roz writes it as a review for your book, Nick. She writes, Adverse is Reaction is a raw, rhythmic, and thought-provoking collection. Paleologos straddles the line between personal and political themes. Unapologetically, he dares to put pen to paper on a mission to shed light on controversial but very real issues. The intensity of his material and sharp wordplay combined cause the poems to radiate with so much emotion. There is something in this book for everybody. 
I am both inspired and completely blown away by the courage, vulnerability, and skill that marks each page from cover to cover. Y'all unmute your mics, please. Give a warm welcome to our very own Nick yeah, You see it. Look at him, y'all. Man, y'all awesome. <laughs> I love it so much. Man, you're gonna make me tear up a little bit. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, Marissa and Red or Green Books. Um, great to be here amongst a great um, amount of poets in the room and everything. <laughs> So I'll give you a little backstory behind ad versus reaction. So I had thought about initially publishing a book about four years ago. And I stopped because it was very expensive. And because I wasn't where I wanted to be as a writer at the time. I lo and behold, um, the pandemic hits. There goes all my cosplay stuff and everything. Um, all the plans that I had for 2020 essentially went down the tube. I get back into the poetry community and I start writing again. And I said, you know what? I want to get back into this writing thing and I want to like put out a book. I wanted, I always wanted to, and here it is, it's the collection and everything. Um, there, there's various amounts of themes throughout the book. There's not really one central theme. It's almost like you're opening the book, you're going into my mind, I'm taking you out, like I'm taking you to church, this is the first poem, like I'm taking you to church, and then all of a sudden it goes into this whirlwind of chaos, controlled, and then right to the last poem where you come back home. So if that makes any sense in everything. Um, the content in this book is so much. There's over 100 pages of poetry in here. And there's also a hidden poem in the book. So I said, what makes this book unique? Is that I put bold lettering in throughout the book and everything. You take those bold letters, bold words, you put it together. That makes the self-titled poem, Adverse Reaction. Um, some of it gets political, some of it gets personal, like the review said. So it's it's for you know for your eyes and everything, and I hope that it helps you at some point. There's always a poem. I always say this: there has to be a poem. Well, not there has to be there. There should be a poem in here that um, is for you on a particular day. And tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a few poems from the book and everything, and um, present them to you. Hopefully that helps you, not only helps you in what you're going through, but also um, can also inspire you to be the next wave of poets. So with that being said, I'm gonna start off with reading some poems for you. This first one, I wrote this one, um, this is a, gets philosophical a little bit. Um, it relates to like the theme of, of death and what I feel that no one, but when you die, you don't, as long as you had an impact on someone, you, um, you, you still live on. That's basically what this whole poem is about. This one's called a candle plate. A bright light started at birth, the twinkle in your baby eyes, curiosity didn't kill you, it was stagnation used to be vibrant or a smile all the time have you walked on heat at coal left your legs behind has your candle melted has life finally gotten to you you being looked over let opportunities slip failed a million times with only a handful of successes being rejected being misfitted the love like a prod against your wax chest, the crest off of your sculpted body, exposed a melted candle with no flame. Why not let your flame rekindle your passion? Are you going to let the outside drown what's left of you? Aren't you still there? 
I am knocking on your body to see if someone is home. Your wick, your wax, your flame, are they still there? A zippo, some wax, and a new wick just for you. Your flame hasn't been disposed of, it has just morphed into something better, brighter. Don't you know when they fuck with your fire, they get singed? Pain is understandable with the fists that you have clenched. You need some air, space, and kindling so that you can breathe fire. That fire is your kindling. You are the beacon in a black hole sun. Won't you come forth and light up the sky? Make sure you bring the supplies and impact individuals. Your fire will never die again after that. So that was that one piece right there. And I'm going through this one. I actually don't think I've ever done this um, piece before, actually. So it's an older piece of mine. Um, this one was when I went into a building. I don't know if people believe in sort of supernatural sort of thing or anything like that, but like sometimes that hits me when I'm in a place where there's like it's abandoned and stuff like that. And you feel spirits there. So this is what it is about and everything um, from a few years ago. This one is called The Chill Factor. I see. I feel it down my neck into my spine. I turn around. There is nothing there. I proceed. I feel it again. The chills. It is a warm summer day. How could there be chills? There's no air conditioning. I look around. Nothing. This old abandoned property, it scares me. But I am calm. My friends, they look at me. They don't see me calm. There is something there. Something we cannot see. I'm not scared anymore. We left. But that spirit it wants me. And for this next one right here. This one is a contrapuntal, so you can read this one three different ways. Um, I love it after uh, one of my favorite um, rock and roll stars of all time, um, Kurt Cobain. And I'm going to read it the three ways. This one is called Kurt. Kurt Cobain in bloom, smelling the roses like teen spirit, broke norms, finding nirvana, coming as he was created. Music distortion, composition, an icon of a generation gone too soon, lost in ether into the 27 Club, never forgotten. The voice lives on in history. He did it all, was the best until the end. I'm going to read it this second way. Kurt Cobain, smelling like teen spirit, finding nirvana as he created distortion. An icon gone too soon into the 27 Club. The voice lives on. He was the best. And the third way. In bloom, the roses broke norms. Coming was music, composition of a generation lost in ether, never forgotten in history, did it all until the end. It's that one right there. And um, let's go into this next one right here. So this uh, next one that I'm going to read for you all. Um, so sometimes, yeah, like I have some problems sometimes, and like this one really highlights the stomach problems and everything, and sort of shines a light on sugar problems with sugar that I have and everything, because like I consume a lot of sugar. So this is what the basic of this poem is about. This one is called Core. 
Sugar is the center of my stomach. That substance graces my insides as it blitzes harder than Lawrence Taylor, providing thunderstruck jolts of fraudulent energy. It is inertia at this point. Sugar rules my world. My world. I am part of the herd with no immunity within a community that takes Dr. Pepper and Reese's whatever contaminated concoction of sugar needed molding me into the clay statue. I say a prayer. I chant for sugar to exit becoming the electrons of my nucleus. This very nucleus needs healthy foods to run this V8 engine of a brain. Sugar's grip over me is strong. I will be tougher and one day make my temple of a body into the beautiful being I want to be. This core of mine, I will let it shine brighter than ever with natural energy. Right. So I'll give you all two more and then I'll be out of your hair and I'll also tell you all about where you can um, get uh, my book and everything like that. So I wrote this one right here. Um, this is one of the um, the last ones in my book. And I wrote this one as more of a healing sort of piece and everything. So this one is supposed to help with the healing process and everything. Um, it was one of the earlier poems that I wrote. And I love this one so much that I want to read this one. Um, this one is called When Comets Cry. When I peer into your eyes, why does your galaxies cry? Instead of seeing stars and meteors fly by, they leak out your eyes. I will wipe them away as we clutch together, turning sadness into supernova. I am sure your trials have been deeper than black holes could understand. Your shoulders colder than Neptune. Your pain as gigantic as Jupiter. Your rage vast as Mars. Are you feeling excluded like Pluto? Well, you are a planet amongst the system. Show yourself some love like Venus. Invest within as Mercury does. It's okay if you spin differently like Uranus. You clutch so tightly to yourself. You hold pain, plenty of pain from these years. Release yourself. Take time to heal. Ground yourself to the earth. Take a breath in and out. Open your eyes and repeat after me. It's going to be okay. So with that being said, I think that the best way to close out is to take everybody to church. I think that this poem is like literally a staple poem of mine. And when I was writing this poem, um, the backstory behind this poem was I was thinking about church and like thinking about like, you know, how the church is like, how churches are very, you know, not good, so to speak. So I was thinking, let's build, why don't I build my own church? You know, <laughs> like, why not us build our own sort of church? So um i'm gonna try to see if i'm not gonna look at the book and try to see if i have this one memorized i think we all know where it goes i'm taking you to church welcome to the church of poeminality we accept everyone here unless you are an oppressor or you have any of these diseases it is not limited to xenophobia racism sexism homophobia biphobia transphobia misogyny and any other hatred of our human race we have services available to rehab those behaviors if you or any members are inflicting any harm you will be booted out faster than des bryant throwing up the x after a touchdown the matrimony is prose and poetry. We anoint the sick with the oils of our ink. We are baptized and confirmed in words. Our ordained ministers are the hosts. We don't do communion here. Community is enough. Our columns have poetry all over them. Our scriptures are poetry slams. Our, wind, our hymns are free verses. Our windows are stained glass of poets of the past and present. Our scaffolding states, you are worth it no confessions here our work is all we need the debts to be paid is your to yourself 
You owe yourself love and to properly tell your story. If you cannot pay, we will work with you. Anyone can attend the Church of Poeminality. Just be brave, be vulnerable, don't be hateful. Most of all, be yourself. We look forward to having you here. And if you are new here, and we all say, I'm taking you to church. The church isn't a building, though. It's every open mic you've ever been to. That's all. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Good job, man. Good job. <laughs> yeah! Oh, tambourine, tambourine, tambourine. Yes. Yeah. That's why they call him Jersey Jesus, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Nick, where can people find you, follow you, all that good stuff since they are, it is also a live stream. So, so I'm hoping a lot of people will get to see this at some point who might not be here today. Absolutely. Um, you all can follow me at the, uh, the real Nick P on IG. That's T-H-E-R-A-L-N-I-C-K-P because sometimes, you know, fraudulent Nick P just like to roam around and everything because I'm the real one. Um, you can also, if you don't have IG, um, Facebook is Nick Paleologos, where you can contact me on there if you want to get my book. Um, my email is npr2389 at gmail.com. That is my email. And then if you want to also check out, see what else I got going on and everything, I have a link tree, just the real Nick P on link tree. And I will also um, drop all my... Um, my stuff, my like cash handles and everything like that and chat and everything. And if you also want to like get the books, you can DM me for the cash handles and everything. And we'll go from there. So thank you all so much. And Marissa, I love that background, by the way. <laughs> I, I put it up, right? Cause I, I love Nirvana. I'm a big Kurt Cobain fan. And so when you were started talking about that, I was like, oh, let me change my background real quick. Uh, so <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> All right, so yeah, that, this is Nick P's book, Adverse is Reaction, Nick Paleo Logos. Uh, Y'all, if you have not had a chance to pick up these post books, please freaking do so. All right, next up, we got Philip Boykin, aka Wordsmith Philly. And I should uh, update my background now that we're done uh, with Nick and his shenanigans. So here we go. We're back, back to regular now. All right. Uh, this is Wordsmith Philly's book, Voices of the Fallen. It is a superb book. Uh, like I was saying last night, your feature last night was amazing. Uh, so many people are still talking about your feature this morning. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. And your book, my friend, should absolutely be required reading at the high school level, uh, even middle school level, and it should also be in universities as, uh, so we, you should look, look into, you know, um, you're in the Bay Area, lots of different uh, schools that are over there, find out who has really, really great programs that, that study the core of what you're talking about in your book, which is the, the North African slave trade. Uh, it's a phenomenal account, y'all. Like the research in, done and the, he, he, uh, the voice is from that era in time, which is not easy to do, uh, to, to put you in a time capsule and transport you uh, to a time that none of us have ever experienced in person uh, is absolutely phenomenal. So I promise you, if you read this book, uh, you will be a better person for that. So I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Mr. Speaker's uh, review of your book. In Voices of the Fallen by Wordsmith Philly, the reader is transported, that's funny, we both said transported, uh, into the mind and heart of desperate, ill-treated, and improperly buried American slaves. You will find a symphony of words and sentences detailing the heartbreak, secret loves, desperate determination, and struggles of the slave fused together poetically while shedding light on America's untold barbaric history. Within these pages, you will find the old soul of a young person seeking to amplify the voices of those who fell during this dark time, a time where rebels acted more like devils and death was the closest many could come to, to could get to freedom. My favorite pieces are Cry, Perfect Slave, and voices of the fallen. While reading this wondering offering, I ask you to imagine all the things individuals endured just for you to read, live, smile, and love freely. Please unmute your mics. Give it up for Philip Boykin, AKA Wordsmith Philly. Yes, Wordsmith. 
How y'all doing? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Woo! We chilling. <laughs> we here. We in That's here. Good. That's good. That's good. Well, I'll me to introduce myself. My name's Philip Boykin, aka Wordsmith Philly. Um, I'm from a small town in uh, Seaside, California. Uh, but I currently live in San Francisco. Um, been writing since I was 12 years old. I got into it because of um, because of a English assignment. Uh, we had to write uh, our own little like rendition of a Maya Angelou poem. And then I pretty much went home and showed my grandma what I wrote, and she was like, "Yeah, I think you got something there." And then uh, pretty much towards high school. I've been writing ever since because I was a shy kid, so it was kind of my way of um, communicating with people. Um, yeah, and I haven't stopped since. So, yeah, I wrote this book, uh, Voices of the Fallen, during the pandemic. Um, it's basically fictional stories about the North African slave trade. Uh, the reason I got into it is because um, I feel like a lot of people talk about Black history which is totally cool, but they never talk about like what really happened with like the slaves and how it kind of affects people today. It affects a lot of stuff today. So I just wanted to bring people into those feelings. It's like, I want you to feel what it feels like to feel the pain of that slave who never got a chance to talk, never got a chance to say anything, being that slaves are pretty much meant to be silenced. I wanted to give them a chance to say what they needed to say, tell them, tell their sides of the story. So that's basically my uh, premise of this book that I wrote. So I will be reading about about four poems from this book. Uh, the first book, first uh, poem I'll be reading is called The Willow. And it's, uh, it's basically about how it feels to, um, how it feels to be around um, around uh, the strange fruit, which is basically swinging bodies. So uh, here we go. The wind blows as the bodies rock. And as the pain grows, the bodies just stuck, piling up and grow a stench that will make your eyes bleed, birthing the begging of the weak to fall to their knees and regurgitate their mama's cooking and daddy's beef stew as the willow trees walk back and forth, rock back and forth, swinging bodies more than two, telling stories without speaking, expressing emotions as it's creaking, while telling you truth through bloody fruits, low hanging, the blood stained roots. No lies were being announced as the bodies talk, expressing knowledge as people gawk at the strange fruit that the willow tree grows. Gaze at gaze from your stoop when the bodies move, when the wind blows. Behold the real America, the America that wants the America that America wants to hide. Be sure to cover your nose as the strange fruit as the strange fruit rots deep into the sunshine. Yeah, so that's the first poem. Yeah, um, I wrote that one because I felt like people like to hide a lot of the stuff. Like they like to hide the fact that there's racism. They like to hide stuff under little things, but it's in plain sight. Like you can see it. Like you can smell it. You can. It's there. That's why I wrote that one. And the next poem I'm gonna write is called Voices of the Fallen. The reason I wrote this is because um, I feel like a lot of people tell the stories, but they don't really tell them the way it really happened. You know what I mean? So this one's called Voices of the Fallen. Hear them here in the wind so clear. Their tears send fears up spines each year, called into as issues remain unsolved continued by historians with wherewithal of knowing 
a painful past of slaves who did not last. Those voices were never heard like misfits in every class, ignored at every turn, rebuked like demonic rituals, erased without a thought like realism in fictionals. It's unfair. The fairest often lie the most. They just bear the damage and hide it under jokes. Try to say that they're fine and blame it on something else. Replace the truth with stories of glory, mistakes they'll never tell. Soon enough, truth shall invite fallen voices to ignite realistic uprise in the night to eclipse lies and open up with truth sunlight. One day, they will be heard, the voices of the fallen. So lend your ear to hear the words of the voices of the fallen. From the murdered to the cursed, I am the one to do their talking, giving them their chance to tell what happened. I am the voices of the fallen. So yeah, <laughs> wrote that one because it's just like, once again, like people like to tell their side, never what really happened. So I just wanted to give an example of it. Just like, I wanna tell you what really happened. Okay, so this next one is called Say Grace. And uh, this is basically about how pretty much slave owners would have their way with slaves, whether it's at the dinner table or whatever. And if they didn't like what they saw, they got rid of it in gruesome ways. So uh, bear with me on this one. There's too many people, way too many people at master's table. Space was needed. Labels separated, weak from able. <coughs> Breeds were made from children and women with childbearing hips. To make super slaves needed for super trips. Made for building houses, heavy lifts and fights, while weak slaves were killed daily and raped every night. It was no thing to hear the body swing or set ablaze faster than rolling papers, or to find exposed, exposed, exposed spines or dangling eyes or babies being fed to hungry gators. So close your eyes and just say grace. Be respectful as you finish your plate. Leave no food left to see and make sure there's no trace or the next victim of the gator land just might be you. So eat, eat well like a super, like a super slave should do. Be thankful you're at master's table and you're not gator food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, um, how much, do I have enough time, uh, Marissa? I got yeah, if you want to do another one, let's go. All right, cool, cool. I got a, I got a two more. They're, they're pretty small, actually. Yeah, I'll just do one more. I'll do one more. Uh, the next one I got is called the the perfect slave. Now, this one that I got, reason I wrote this one is because um, I was watching uh, I was watching Django, and like, you know, even though it's like fictional, but somewhat somewhat true, kind of sort of. I was just thinking about it, like the way they like pretty much broke down how they got their slaves you know they did a bunch of, like a bunch of like tests and you know they get them when they're young and they like breed them make sure they don't know nothing and just break them up and just bring them up to be a slave instead of just being whatever they were meant to be just having them work and do stuff under them so i got the i wrote this one basically as as Massa pretty much telling people how to get a perfect slave. So this is called the perfect slave. How do you go about making the perfect slave? How do you make the rebellious willingly behave? When they tilt your ship of obedience, can you surf those rocky waves? When they groom your rough look, where is your trust? Where is your trust? 
when they start your shave? How do you get those slaves to be on the same page? When you know that they wanna kill you, no matter what gender or age? I'll tell you, you get them when they're young. You kill men in front of their young. You harm women, snatch their young. Make sure you get those tender young. After you ruin families, tend to their young. Force them to seek death, but do not mend their young. You see, now you got a well-oiled machine ready to follow your rules and live out your dreams of being a landowner without doing any work. A dream of being great without, uh, while owning slaves with no worth. Ah, behold the beauty of destructive greed made by you, the one with reproductive needs, but you still have ones that don't mind you as you whip and torture and pillage, call calls of obedience as you order a wounded village. The rebels grow tired of the business that you grew. In order to end revolts of rebels, you have to display reflect, a reflection of devils as you maim and hang the rioters who run. Continue the revolts and continue this until the revolts are done. Then one day, you'll see the admiration in your work. A perfect slave take away any ways of self-worth, a perfect slave. Hidden cries under worn out rags, a perfect slave. Happy to paint a smile on its tasteless face, a perfect slave. You did good, boy. You did real good. Thank you. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a puddle. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. an absolute yeah. puddle right now. Wow. Y'all need to get this book. Um Philip, where can people find you, follow you, get your book, all that good stuff, my friend? All right. I'll, I'll tell you. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Because we are live, so. <laughs> okay, how to find me. All right, you find me on uh, Facebook, Philip Boykin, uh, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-B-O-Y-K-I-N. And you find me on Instagram. Uh, it's wordsmith philly 8989 So wordsmith, so W-O-R-D. Smith, S M I T H, Philly, P H I L L Y, 8989, the numbers. And uh, yeah, how to get my book. Um, hold on, I don't know if this works. Okay. There if, you go. There you go. Hey, can you <laughs> see that? This is how you get my book. All right. These are my cash handles. Here it is right here. Write it down. Write it picture. down. I, I, don't, I don't care. Just get it in there. That's how you get it. Yes. You get it right Let's go. Yeah, you feel like you there. should totally print that out too, so you can flash that across the screen at your online events. You know. I'm about to do that. I'm about to do that. Uh, just, just go ahead and print that out. <laughs> yeah. Per perfect. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. All right. Y'all know how to do that. Uh, and if you know teachers in your community. Uh, who are either teaching high school or college or junior college or any sort of outreach organizations that could use um, any of the books from any of the poets uh, today, please, please, please just do it. You know, like we were talking last night, Poet Khan's book absolutely needs to be in every Black Studies program. Your book needs, is is same thing, absolutely uh, needs to be part of, of teaching the real history and the real part of our past, uh, you know, just because you don't want to talk about things doesn't make it not true, right? That's true. This is the race things. That's true. It's uh, like, we, 
We need to do it's that. Like it needs to. It needs to be said, man. It's like I'm just getting tired of people acting like it's not happening when it is. You know, it's just not. People need I, to hear what I, happened. I live in New Mexico, right? I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I had no idea that during World War II we had um, Chinese concentration camps here. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that, right? Oh, yeah, and, um, it went down out here. It went down. Yeah, there's so many things. And so we, we have to talk about even the ugly bits, right, of our past and, and um, acknowledge them. And I think not talking about things, it doesn't make them go away. And what's worse is that we don't have an opportunity as parents to educate our children appropriately. And so me being a mom raising two kids, it's exponentially important that they understand what happened in the world. Uh, so like required reading is AJ Houston still black for my t- almost 12 year old daughter. <laughs> That's required freaking reading for her. Uh, That's she, crazy, man. She's going to start with Steel Black, uh, AJ, Houston's, uh, AJ Houston's book of poetry and continue through his collections. Um, it's a good place to start uh, for her they we have to we 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 owe it to all of the people who came before us Mm -hmm. and all the people who are coming ahead of us or after us uh to to instill them with the knowledge so that their actions can be true to their soul and to their heart you know i think people just don't know what they don't know and they can't um they can't get angry about stuff they don't know (laughs) <laughs> right and we can't do better if we don't know better so like my angelou said you know you know better do better we have to educate and we do that through our poetry through our books this is why publishing is so huge it's it's, it's monumentally game-changing what we're doing here uh publishing poets and their work um so. yeah man it's i feel like the more voices we get out there the more truth will come out you know it's just Absolutely. I feel like poets have the have have a have an advantage because they get to tell their truth and others' truth. So, and you know, you know, it also, Philip, like this is your legacy. This mm-hmm. is your legacy. This is Nick's legacy. This mine's right here. This next, this next right here. These two right here. Yeah, you see, you see it. You you see it. You, you see it. It's, it's forever it's forever this book of yours and no one can ever take it from any of you yeah. it'll always be out in the world um the power mm-hmm. behind that so even if something were to happen and you weren't here tomorrow the book will always be here sure. and there's no one who could tell your story but you um, look, 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 oh, oh, oh damn look at that right there it's oh, a whole book that. right yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta, put some white ears on it and be like you can pet it. <laughs> I gotta burp the baby. I gotta burp the baby. Burp. Oh, oh yeah. wait a minute. Got, gotta change his diaper. Changing the diaper. Let's go. Yes. All right. Hey, Word Smith, are you gonna come to Word is Right on Saturday and be part of the feature of the features? Do you want to be in that um, lineup? Let me see. I will be, I will actually be in uh LA for a family uh it's a family family thing but okay it's all right um, i just figured i would invite what you. what time is it what time does this start it'll be at 6 p.m mountain standard time so it'll be five o'clock where you are mm. but it'll go for like it'll go for a couple hours yeah that's right know? i know that i might i might try to stop in i don't mind catching the show i mean cool. if yeah. you if you happen to be able to pop in quickly just message me and i'll try to put you on if you want i mean it's just a fun opportunity to plug the show i uh, plug your book and and whatnot and i just uh it's a way to bring the features kind of back to the table too yeah. uh, who knows i might i might put my family on there since they'll be there you, i'll just you should you should my crash the party take your <laughs> take all of the books with you and tell your family i need this my goal is to sell all of these and I have them buy like all your books for you uh mm-hmm. from you um oh, yeah. yes uh, it's, it's got to start with family and friends and and everyone exponentially needs all of the, the literature oh uh, wait i gotta i gotta say this since since i could see her on here poet con your hair is amazing she's amazing look at that hair look at that hair look look at that that is amazing how do you do that i can't i can't do that it doesn't grow but yours, yours is amazing. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> Hang on. All right, so what I'm going to do is, uh, because we have four poets who were not able to be here today, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce their books real quick and flash them on the event here. So those of you who are watching can can come back uh, and check out their books. And this is only in alphabetical order by uh, poet name. Uh, this is Ebb and Flo. This is uh, Poems by Miro. Uh, and the visual uh, cover art is by Mario Mean. Oh shit, uh, um, Miro, I'm sorry. It's like the French name. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful cover. It got a lot of attention in El Paso. Um, she's a sensational poet, and uh, and her book is uh, documents a lot of her time in New York City and her love for the city, her love uh, struggles and relationships and all of that good stuff. All right, this next one is The Struggle Within Poems by Pam Rice, uh, cover art of, again by Shane Maynard uh, with Guerrilla Poets. And this documents really her life as a queer poet with bipolar disorder uh, and depression in the South. She is a sensational. If you um, know anyone who has ever struggled, uh, queer or straight, I mean, this is a phenomenal book, talks a very forward about mental health. Uh, we have uh, Lady Lotus by Rosalind Diaz, and a poet from the Bronx. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head who did the cover art for her book, but it is a beautiful cover, Roz. Uh, and this talks a lot about, again, you know, kind of growing into womanhood and love and in and out of love and uh, the, the, her time in New York, but also the death of her grandmother, uh, growing through grief, a lot of family things are in this book as well. It is a lovely, touching, very feminine book. And we have a uh, schoolyard prescriptions and pro, uh, schoolyard crushes and Prozac prescriptions. Uh, this is Tori Letts' book, uh, cover art. Uh, I want to say she, yes, Tori supplied her own cover art for this book. And it is phenomenal. This woman is uh, a graduate of Florida State University. And I want to say Brown? I don't remember, but uh, I should wonder if it's in her butt. But anyways, she um, she's she's a sensational poet. She ha uh, received her her an honors thesis at Florida State University. Uh, the, her book is very um, much so the angst of being a woman and finding yourself amidst a lot of strife, trials, tribulations. Uh, within the world her it's very um uh, smart i it's it's very intelligent uh this book and if you're a woman you will love this book uh because she's just she's super sassy but also um uh, deeply moving as well so if you uh have not had a chance to see some of these poets they every single one of these poets has been featured at the word is right this year uh all of the videos are archived on the page on the word is right w-r-i-t-e so you can do that you can see that plus we also had the book launch and uh, right here at red or green books and so you you heard from every single one of the poets earlier uh this winter uh, this fall uh, and you got to hear their poetry. If you would like to buy all 10 of the next 10 books or the original 10 books, the complete sets of all 10 are available on the website, redorgreenbooks.com. Red is R-E-A-D. And of course we have the Women's Erotic Anthology, which Flo Khan, AKA the Fishnet Poet is in this book. Uh, we are alongside 31 women, five different countries, uh, almost 23,000 words of beautiful erotica in this book. Uh, cover art by Shane Maynard with Gorilla Poets as well. The reviews are in, uh, everything is available there. And of course, as always, you can get my book, uh, Conversations with Grief. I always forget to plug my book. Like at the end of every set I do, I forget to plug this. I'm not gonna forget today. Uh, Conversations with Grief details the one year I wrote poetry um, after my friend made the decision to end her life. And so it's uh, it's dealing with all of that. All right. Um, otherwise, oh, look at Emily's got my book. See, it never gets old. It never gets old to see another poet holding up your butt. Like straight up, it, it will light up a fire under your butt uh, for the rest of your life. You just want to keep cranking out books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, always beautiful. 
<laughs> yes, wordsmith Philly, yes. All right, uh, but otherwise we can uh, unmute our mics, give a big round of applause to all of our uh, poets today. And I ask you to please go and purchase from the poets. If you want the sets, get the sets uh, from the press. And uh, yeah. All right, unmute your mics, you guys. Congratulations Yay. on your books this year. Yes, poets. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so much fun. I cannot wait to announce the next 13, the Baker's Dozen for next summer. Uh, the letters of intent will go out the beginning of the year. If you know poets who are interested in publishing who've never had an opportunity, look at Emily's got all the like cards out. I love it. Yes, yes, let's go. Uh, if you have- I'm Anna Whiting this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. If you if you know anyone who would like to publish who's never had an opportunity to publish a, a full collection, uh, send them my way, please. Uh, we have a full list for next year, but uh, those are not guaranteed. Uh, contracts are not um, in yet. So there is wiggle room, I will I will bet uh, for next year. And I want to, uh, to to do at least 13 and 13 and then do a couple anthologies next year. So uh, otherwise, thank you all so very much for being here. I can't believe this show went on as long as it did. I was like, this is gonna be great. Um, please feel free to share the live for those who couldn't be here today that they can watch you back. Uh, Poe Khan, thanks for coming in, my little. Always good to see you. Um, bringing, bringing that fire energy and um, yeah. Otherwise I will just see you all uh, next, uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, Poet Khan and I, do not forget, Poet Khan and I are hosting Moist Mondays. That is our bi, uh, bi monthly uh, uh, erotic open mic. We do it the second and fourth Monday of the month. It is going to be sexy, sexy. So uh, don't forget, get your butts to Moist Mondays. The posters are already up on Word is Right. It, the Zoom is the same every event. So there's no excuses and uh, come bring your sensual poems, love poems, sexy poems. And uh, we're going to bring down the house tomorrow night with that. And then next Saturday night is the, is the one year anniversary of the word is right, where we invite all of the features back uh, to read. And it's going to be a great, a great, great show. But thank you all so much for being here. And if y'all need anything, please feel free to just call me, text me, message me, reach out to me. And uh, I'm here for you guys, okay? Mwah! Great to see everyone again. Be well, everyone. Yeah, thanks. You, awesome thanks, everyone. job, everybody. Peace. Bye. Have a good night. Bye, Thank everyone. You for me. I greatly appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Thank you. You're welcome, Philip. I'm so glad you're here. All right, we'll always, see you guys. Always. All right, bye bye.